Check one, check one, two, three. Hey everybody, it's Michael Helms, also known as Michael the Sound Guy, and this is the Location Sound Podcast. You know, each episode we talk with location sound mixers, boom ops, and other industry pros about the various aspects of recording sound on location, whether it's for feature and independent films, TV commercials, interviews, any time where dialogue from actors is recorded. I started my career in the recording studios in New York City with some of the big artists back in the day, and later on projects for networks like HBO, Sci-Fi Channel, and the Cartoon Network. As time went by, I got out of the studio and began working in production sound. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or just starting out, thanks for joining us. All right, my guest today is a production sound mixer based out of Los Angeles, California. He's worked on documentaries, reality TV, and commercial productions. He originally is from Dublin, Ireland. Please welcome James Nolan. Hey there, how's it going, Michael? Thanks a lot for having me. All right, now, James, we always start the show by asking when you're mixing on set, what's in your audio kit? So tell us about your mics, your mixer, power distro, and everything in between. Absolutely. So um, I'm what you could class as a, a sound devices guy. I've, I've used sound devices gear my whole career in, in production sound, really. Um, what, I'm, what I'm using right now is a 788 um, with, a, with a CL8. So I'm predominantly bag based as you mentioned there i deal with a lot of vng uh, reality doc work uh, that would be the, the most most of my work is is like that so yeah i got the 788 the cl8 and then wireless wise currently uh, i've got electro sonics srb and um, with two smqvs as the transmitters and then i have a a WYSICOM dual receiver with two of the transmitters which i think they call them N- ntps i think they're called yeah, my, my boom mics that I use. Um, right now, my, my go-to shotgun mic is a DPA 4017. And I've got both of the, the preamps for the B and the C. And then my was that my non-shotgun mic would be a MKH 8050 Sennheiser, which I love. And then those two pretty much cover everything I do but in regards to boom mics. Um, I also have a few 8040s. Uh, and I have a nice uh, Rycote stereo kit for when I do like ambient stuff. Um, and then lav mic wise, I, I use all, all DPAs. Uh, I've been all DPAs for about three or four years now. I hate myself for it because I don't want to go back. I don't like any other lav mics than, than DPAs. So yeah, I've got two DPA slims and two uh, 4060s. And that's, uh, that's the majority of my kit, pretty much. Um, I use Sennheiser IEMs as as Comtex. Uh, and then if I need more, if I need more of anything, uh, as you know, I, I rent it. And um, if I need more than four wireless, I'll rent. If I need more Comtex, I'll rent. It's job specific. Uh, but I find what I have covers the vast majority of the of the work I get. Okay. Now, uh, what kind of time code boxes do you use? Yeah, I'm using uh, Tentacle Syncs right now. Uh, the, the first generations, the ones that they came out with, and they work brilliantly for me. Yeah, I have two of those. So I usually I'll just jam off the 788, leave them on the camera. I've got all the different sort of cables for uh, the different connectors, uh, the, the annoyingly different connectors that different cameras have. So, you know, you've got Limo for RE cameras and 4-pin Limo for RED cameras and everything else pretty much uses BNC. Um, but I like them a lot. I wouldn't mind having the new ones. They've got new ones that uh, you can adjust with Bluetooth which seemed pretty cool. But I think it's a great thing. There's so many companies offering different tiny time code solutions within the last couple of years, which is great because before then, it was a much more limited market. Absolutely, yeah. I ha- actually have some of the first generation tentacle sync boxes as well. And yeah, they work great. I, I was on a short film and we had them stuck to the back of the digital slate, jam sync from the mixer, you know, worked fine all day to the camera as well. They had a DIT on set, and by the end of the day, they had a rough cut for us. And I was really impressed with the fact that, first of all, the DIT was able to sync everything really quick, lay it all out, and give us a, you know, a quick sneak peek before we left for the day. So that was great. That was very cool. Yeah. You you talked about WYSICOM. So you've got some electrosonics. You've got WYSICOM. So tell us about your WYSICOM experience. 
Uh, I've had them now for, I want to say, nine months, eight, eight months, nine months. And they're, and they're different. So it, first of all, it's, it's super wideband, I think. And I'm sure I don't want to be quoted on this, but I, I do believe it's more wideband than anything Electro offers. In terms of it goes from, you know, down from like 470 all the way to 680 or something like that. I like having both systems, to be honest with you. I like having the WYSICOM because of that super wideband capability. But then again, I also like having Lectros. I mean, Lectros, especially in terms of the transmitter, they're just, they're so bulletproof, you know. I'm sure you've seen that video of the Lectro have where they fire one of them out of a like potato cannon into a bunch of wind chimes and they pick it up and it still works. Um, I like having the WYSICOM. They have this very high quality compander setting um, that you don't, I believe you don't get as much range on it, but but there's just, there's that extra sheen of, of fidelity. And um, I have this project called Field Jams where I actually record musicians out in the open, out in fields and, and stuff. And I did one recently uh, where I used... Um, the, the sort of that high quality compander mode on the WYSICOMs with DPA labs, uh, one in a guitar, one on a singer. Uh, and it just sounded fantastic. But yeah, no, I love having both. I love Lectro as well, by all means. Um, I think they're, they're both definitely in the, the higher echelons of, of wireless, uh, along with, uh, you know, like Zaxcom, of course. And uh, who's the new one that Sound Devices bought? Audio Limited, is that the one? Yes. Yeah, and they offer, and that's like a fully digital system that they offer. Yeah, I've been watching Audio Limited. I've been seeing people talk in the forums and trying to decide, is that something I, you know, a uh, direction I want to go or not? So I'm not sure yet. Yeah, I think, that, well, the weird thing that comes up with all sound mixes with, in regards to wireless is uh, we, we all kind of wish we just had these recording transmitters. The only company that offers them, and there's like patent issues, of course, with it, is Zaxcom. I'm not one to comment on patent law, really, but I do kind of wish that every company could offer a recording transmitter, I wish there was a bit more competition in that market. Not to say anything bad about Zaxcom, I've used, I've used a lot of their gear and I, I, I love a lot of it. I love, I've used the, the Diva, the Fusion, I used the Nomad once uh, and I've used their wireless before, it's all, it's all fantastic. I did, for a little bit, I had uh, Electro's recording transmitters, but obviously they can only record or transmit, they can't do both simultaneously because uh, of the patent, so... Definitely something to watch for the future. I'm hoping for every company to offer a, a recording transmitter eventually. Yeah, th yeah, that would be great for everybody. Yeah. Uh, oh, you mentioned power. Power-wise, uh, I use. I was an early adopter of uh, of Audio Route. Um, I got an Audio Route BDS in I want to say 2014 with two of the their brand their Audio Route batteries, um, and I've used that uh, ever since. Recently, I got another battery because remote audio now offer the, the same batteries those high q batteries and those will power me like most of a day off of one uh, which is great uh, and that's powering a 788 which is extremely power hungry because it uses transformerless preamps and everything it's it sucks up a lot of power and um, but anyone on like a, a six series uh, mixer or anything else they, they get a lot more mileage out of it so uh, I, I think it's the best system right now in terms of power especially in a bag. Yeah, I have the remote audio as well. And it's it's a great little system, but the, at least the version, I don't have the attachment to see the, the actual voltage left and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's yeah, it's very handy. And you can see it change depending on what you, like if you turn on an extra input or two on your recorder, you can see your, your hours and minutes go down. Uh, it let, lets you judge things off of that. It's, it's pretty nice. Now, uh, you talked about DPA lav mics. What were you using before that? I was using Tram TR50s, uh, which have been very popular for a long time, I think. They're great. They're fantastic mics. I, I love the kit that it comes with, with all the sort of accessories. Like you get like a, a standard tie clip, you get a, a vampire clip. The box that they come in with the foam cut out was really handy. Uh, that's one thing I don't like about DPA. I think the boxes, the, the, the little plastic cases that you get with DPAs are... You're just asking for trouble. Every time you open it, something pops out. But um, no, yeah, I did. I like the trams and I still have them. I still have a, I have a tram wired for Electro as a, as a backup and then I have another tram wired for uh, one eighth. That's one thing I do in, in a pinch 
if I haven't rented an additional wireless and something comes up on set where I need additional wireless, I can. I have a G3 kit that I can just use. I actually picked up recently a G4 kit, uh, and it, it works great. I, I've been real pleased with it. I've been using it as a camera hop. I've used it as a just wireless boom IFB, you know, so I could hear what, what was going on at the mic. And that's got, uh, it's got higher RF output yes. than G3s? Is that cool. Yeah, you've got like three different power settings, so. That's cool, yeah. Is it compatible with G3 receivers, I wonder? That's a good question. I, I don't. I have to look into that. Because I wouldn't mind, because right now my... My hop slash IFB transmitter is just a G3. And I use that, yeah, like I said, for hops and for IFBs. But I wouldn't mind if I had one that was more powerful. I actually had mine modified by uh, Andrew Jones, a local mixer, who he now, he's like the main guy at uh, Deity Microphones. Okay. He he modified my transmitter. He gave it a, an SNA connector. So I use like a remote audio, like a... Miracle Whip antenna with it. But it's handy because I do a lot of car commercials. And if I need to transmit out of a car, uh, I have this uh, window mount that I can connect and I can get the antenna outside of the car from my bag. So if people are in like a follow van and they have the IMs, they can they get better range. Or if I need to leave my bag in a car, I can listen to it wirelessly by getting the antenna outside. Obviously, the perfect solution to that would just be something that records, like recording transmitters or something like that. But I'm um, not there yet. Okay. That's a good idea. So it's a little window mount or uh, roof mount kind of a thing? Yeah, I can't remember who makes it. It was only, it was only like $20. I think I, I bought it at um, one, of the, one of the sound shops here, uh, Location Sound Corp. Yeah, I think it was like $20, but it, uh, yeah, it just it remotes your antenna to, yeah, you can mount it like on a window. You roll up the window of the car and it sort of mounts onto the roof. Hmm. Yeah, I was uh, toying with the idea of getting the antennas replaced as well because today I actually was using them and I, I kept, I, I had it clipped on my pocket and I kept bending the antenna. I was like, you know, over time, this is not going to work well. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and someone someone did a test where they found out that uh, modding the connector gives you a better range, which take that with a grain of salt. But I, I did see a... I did see a, an in-depth test where they tested it, like the stock antenna versus one of the modded ones, and they were getting better range. I have to look into that further. Yeah, I want to get my some of my receivers modded as well, uh, some of the IMs. But I've got, I just got to. I, I think Wilcox Sound here will do it. Uh, I haven't been able to get a hold of Andrew. He's a, he's a busy man now with with that company that he's got going. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about some of your projects you've worked on. I noticed. Uh, you had a DIY network. You worked on a show called First Time Flippers. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So actually at the time I was living in Orlando, um, which you know all about, all about Orlando. Uh, I was living there and yeah, I got hired for just like a two day shoot uh, on that. And that was my first, that was my first sort of foray into, um, into sort of a, a DIY show, a house flipping show. So it was interesting. First gig I did in a long time where I wasn't using my gear. I was using gear they provided. And you can imagine the state the gear was in because it had just been moving from flipped house to flipped house. There was just dust over everything. Just a mess. But uh, it worked, you know, it was sound devices and electro gear. So it was pretty solid. I've done a lot of work for them in Florida. And then I did work throughout the southern US I did a few different shoes with them and then recently I've done some in California it's almost always been a 664 with uh, 3 or 4 Electro 411s and then they have Sankin uh, COS 11 labs a few weeks ago I did one and it was actually they had a 633 which I think for that job was just a lot better they, they didn't need extra inputs you know it's it's usually sort of a small cast you're dealing with like the the two flippers of the house and then any people they interact with, like contractors or uh, people selling tile or something like that, you know. Okay. What, what's the setup when you're micing everybody up? Uh, for that show, usually, yeah, I would just set up the day, mount hops on the camera. Sort of like just a, a typical day, you know, I make sure everything's good. Jam time code if it needs to be, scan all my wireless. For micing people on that show, they want hidden labs. I mean, everyone these days once hidden laughs, it seems, uh, regardless of the context, <laughs> apparently. So yeah, just COS 11s, and I had them in the, the RM11 mount with a, with a bit of mold skin. Usually, I would just go straight to their skin, 
like the upper chest or to the clothes uh, if I can if I can do that as well. All right. Now you also were a supervising sound editor for a short called Not Much Time. Not Much Time. Yeah, that was sort of my friend's, I guess, passion project. I have a friend, uh, Neil Watson. He's a fantastic uh, camera operator, DP, and that was sort of his a short film that he made and directed. And the, the funny story there is a lot of the crew and the cast were were from the Avatar films, the, the James Cameron Avatar sequels. So I'm great friends with Neil. He just bought me on to do sounds. Yeah, that was that was very interesting because not only was I doing production sound, I did post. And it's worth mentioning, I did post sound before I got into production sound. That, so I made that transition early in, in my career. But not much time was fantastic to work on. Yeah, it was it was interesting because we, we shot in a lot of interesting locations. There's a there's this diner called I think it's called the Four Aces Diner. It's like northwest of LA, and we and we filmed there. And there's a lot of movies being filmed there. Uh, it's like a diner slash gas station that you've seen in probably lots of movies. Were there any particular challenges that you had on set when you were recording that? Not particularly. It was it was actually really easy compared to most narrative work I do. I do very little narrative work and that was just single camera. They planned out all the shots really well. They always did close-ups so I could always get a get a boom nice and close when I needed to. As opposed to some other narrative jobs I've done where a lot of people these days are shooting multi-cam and you know typical the sound mixer's nightmare of having a super wide and a tight being shot simultaneously. So you've got, you're relying on the labs pretty much. Okay. Now I also see here you were working on a reality doc for called Red Bull Levels. What is that about? Oh, that was, uh, that was very interesting for me because, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big, I'm a big gamer. Yeah. That was with a, I believe they're a French slash English production company. Yeah. Levels is, is about game developers. What they were filming was uh, about a game called Star Citizen. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's it's the, the the largest crowdfunded video game in history. They've raised millions through crowdfunding, and the, the game still isn't released yet. But we went to their offices here in LA to basically to interview the game developers, all the sort of the various three D artists they had, uh, and their studio was just it was incredible. A lot of it was done up as sort of like a spaceship, like in the game they're making. And yeah, it's crazy to see just how much money is being put into a project that's, that's not finished yet. But we did some interesting shots. We did a lot of walk and talks around their office where we, they'd stop by cubicles and things. So I was just sort of, th this is a scenario you run into a lot in reality work where you have a subject, you have a mic on them, cameras following them, and they're in interacting with various people. Um, and to keep things sort of seamless, uh, they don't want to stop, have you mic new people. So what you do is you just, the people they're interacting with, you boom them and just pretty much leave the lav mic for the, for the main talent. I've done that quite a lot. Uh, I think a lot of reality doc mixers can, can relate to that. Now, do you uh, use like uh, Ursa straps or Viviana or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. I use, um, I've got two Viviana waist straps that I use a lot. Um, and then I've got an Ursa ankle strap um, that I had to use quite recently I did a project, a 10-day shoot, uh, the one I mentioned to you earlier that I just got off. There were a lot of stunts involved and stunt coordinators are, are big fans of ankle straps. They don't like lav packs being on someone's back or being near their waist, especially if they're going to be hitting the ground. They, they definitely want you to be ankle strapping. The downside to using an ankle strap is the transmitters on the ground, right? So it's, it's not, you're not going to get as much range. Um, you're relying on your your receiver antenna system to to get you a good range there, but yeah, the they're all great. The Viviana straps, the Ursa straps, the the guys that run Viviana are, are good fun. If you follow them on on Instagram and such, they're uh, they're they're good crack, as we'd say in Ireland. <laughs> well, speaking of Ireland, I guess when you were you grew up there, how'd you get into sound? I think I was about 12 or 13. I started playing guitar. I had just an old, I had a PC in my room and just, I remember for a long time I was using like a, a recording program called like Gold Wave or something to record myself, strumming the guitar with a, 
or like a piece of crap like desktop microphone <laughs> um, and then one day a friend of mine got me a copy of Sonar uh, by Cakewalk which was my first sort of digital audio workstation it was the first time I saw oh wow you can have multiple tracks and you can record multiple tracks and mix them together and the, the, the first multi-track recording thing I did I guess was I I just overdubbed myself playing a the acoustic guitar intro to a Metallica song called Battery. Um, and once I sort of did that, I was like, this is really cool. I, I, I want to do this. Um, whether or not I'm playing guitar, I want to I want to point microphones at things and, and press record. <laughs> um, so that's how, that's how I got into it. And for the, for the longest time, I was just recording like, you know, my friends, local Irish artists, just make demo CDs for them. Um, I got into post-production sound eventually when I started using Pro Tools and I did uh, just various like short films and, and things like that. It wasn't until I moved to the US that I that I got into production sound. Um, the, the closest thing I'd done before that was I'd I had done a lot of sound effects recording in the field. I, I did a job uh, in coordination with a company called Bohemia Simulations. They make a lot of military simulators for like uh, for the Brits and for for the US, and did a job where we, we were recording sound effects with the British Army, and uh, basically we were recording their tanks and their armored vehicles, and that was the that was the closest I'd done to sort of field work before I got into production sound. Uh, but it was similar; we were using sound devices gear on that. It's just we were pointing microphones at a tank engine as opposed to <laughs> as opposed to an actor. But then, yeah, when I moved to the US, I got into production sound. Um, I'm trying to think, my, my first sort of televised credit in the US, I think, was a Nat Geo reality show called Lords of War, which was just about auctioning off weapons, pretty much, and, and specialists who talk about that. That was in Florida, of course. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, from, from there, I just, I did various sort of re- reality shows. My first setup was a... A 744, sound device a 744 with a 552 mixer. So pretty heavy for what it was, but uh, but I liked it a lot. And then I did, I got picked up a few years later, I got picked up by, uh, yeah, by, by Full Sail University. I was doing a shoot, the shoot I was on was using one of their sound stages. And one of the teachers there saw me and said, uh, do you want to come, do you want to teach? She seemed like you know what you're doing. And I said, yeah, sure. It was actually the, the course director for sound for film, a full sale, uh, Dave White. Uh, he he roved me into that job. Uh, and I can't thank him enough because I, I taught there for three years and it was fantastic. Uh, and a lot of the students I had, they're out here in LA now as well. And I sort of stayed friends with them. And it's full circle. Like they get me work now, which is very interesting. Now, what classes did you teach when you were at Full Sail? It was all sound for film, basically. Um, I think their program is different now, but when I was there, there was there was one month that was just sound for film, and every film student took that. So it was mostly production sound. We taught a little bit of post uh, as well. But yeah, it was just boom operating, the, the basics about microphones, um, about wiring people. But every, every month, you know, there'd be a class of, I don't know, 20 to 50 or more. Um, you know, maybe... Maybe one or two of them would genuinely see themselves as being as wanting to do that in the future, um, which is fine because at that stage, when you when you're in film school, you know there's a lot of people want to they want to be directors, they want to be cinematographers. Not too many of them are thinking about about being production sound mixers. Now you also talked about uh, you did some video game sound. Is there some projects you can talk about that? Yeah, so that was actually. That was tied into the the British Army recordings that we did in two thousand and six, two thousand seven. There was uh, a very popular game at the time was Battlefield Two by EA and Dice, and very popular were what what are called mods for the game, so modifications to the game that you could just install and play, and they would change all different aspects of the game. So the, the most popular mod for BF2 was called Project Reality, which was all about making it more realistic. And I got I got bought onto that team as a sound designer, essentially. That was sort of so I was I was putting my post knowledge to work that I already had. 
yeah and I was eventually like I was sort of like the lead sound guy at one point um, but that was all about like putting engine sounds into the into the game and uh, a lot of weapon sounds and I think yeah I think the coolest thing to come of that from a sound perspective was uh, that recording trip we, we did uh, where we went to Bovington in England and, and recorded the, the Royal Armoured Corps that, and like I said I was in coordination with uh, Bohemia Simulations now, were you involved in the programming of the of the sounds, or were, like what engine were they using? Well, it was the the sort of the the proprietary engine for Battlefield Two, which I think was called Refractor or something like that. And I'm not a coder at all, so I was using pretty much templates that were already set out when the game itself was developed, and I was sort of inserting sounds into that and adjusting how they would be played. Uh, and I wasn't, I can't take all the credit. I wasn't alone on that sound team. And there was a, a user called Sofad, a German guy, who had also did a lot of the work. Uh, he was the original sound guy. I just ended up coming on and helping him. Now, uh, we usually always ask, what's your worst on-set experience? That's interesting. I'll tell you one, one interesting thing about working in the US for me is I find there's, I find it quite easy to diffuse situations purely based on the novelty of being Irish. I don't <laughs> I think you see where I'm going there. Um, so I kind of, I can get myself out of trouble pretty easily. But in terms of like bad experiences on set, there's a lot of, I guess, misnomers about sound guys going around. I did have a, there was this feature and the, the DP on it. Day one, I introduced myself to him and he doesn't say hello. He just goes, I don't like sound guys. And I'm just thinking, and I don't think he was particularly joking, you know what I mean? I just laughed it off. But um, that's that's sort of a problem in the industry, you know, the this, this notion of the, the sound, the production sound mixer being, I don't know, annoying in a, in a sense. So I think, yeah, any negative experiences I've had have sort of, they, they've come from that. You know, there's a, there's a certain, there's an aspect of the sound mixer being looked down on. In terms of bad experiences... The, on, the only real bad experiences I have are when, when, I, when I have lav issues, when I want to adjust a lav, but I can't, you know what I mean? Uh, given, you know, e- either talent is just on a roll and you don't want to interrupt them. This happens a lot in, in documentaries and, and reality where you, you've got to gauge the situation. Like, can I interrupt what's going on now? I, is that worth fixing that lav? Or do I just say, screw it and just, I'll, I'll get it on the boom. And I can adjust that when all this ends. You know what I mean? That's uh, it's not really like a narrative work. You can you can usually uh, ask for things to be sort of put on hold while you make adjustments. Um, but if you're shooting for, I, I do a lot of work for Vice News. You know, and there's there's scenarios where I just can't can't make adjustments. So it's it's all about when you put a lav mic on someone, you better make sure it's as good as possible and secure and. You're not going to get issues because you, you never know what's going to happen during the shot. Yeah, that's always a challenge because it's like, and if you're just, say you just have a, a wireless lav on and you're not booming and there's there's a problem, do I break this performance? Do I interrupt, like you said, interrupt what's going on or, or what? So Yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes in reality, depending on the producer you're with, you can sort of say, oh, look, can we, can we try and, you know, do that again? Um, but if it's a, if it's documentary work, you know, that's ra- rarely going to happen. You know what I mean? But that's, that's part of the game. I, I think I, that's, that's a challenge that I, that I relish, to be honest. Um, and that, that's why I like this job so much. It's your, your recording sound in unideal circumstances. That's the challenge. How do I get the best recording possible? Recording here on a busy street in the middle of LA. How do I record here? We're on a beach. We're very close to the waves. How do I get good sound here? It's, it's a challenge that I like. And it's, it's why I love my job so much, to be honest. Now, have you ever forgotten any equipment when you were going to an audio gig? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, I know several times when I've already arrived at a location and we need to repo somewhere else. And this this is a hilarious thing to admit, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. I often like I set up everything and I just I forget my headphones. You know, it happens, to be honest with you, it happens all the time. Like, we'll, we'll sort of I'll prep all the gear and we'll, we'll be repoing somewhere and I've, like, jammed time code. I've put hops on, I've 
cald with tone and everything. And then we like leave the room or wherever we're storing all of our gear. And I'm like, oh shit, I forgot my headphones. Like the, It's like the one thing you think you really remember because <laughs> of what you're listening with. But it's, uh, it's always easy to forget. In terms of forgetting things to bring to set, I think I'm pretty good at, at remembering that. Uh, I don't think I ever let it happen when I was in Florida. I think if it were to happen in LA, I think LA is a more forgiving city for that because you can you can get gear pretty quick. Um, there's there's so many production sound shops and there's a there's a big there's a Facebook community called LA Sound Mixers, um, where you can just sort of like say, hey, I'm on set. I see it all the time. I see people say, hey, I'm on set and I forgot this BDS cable. Can anyone help me? Is anyone in this part of town? And they usually get a pretty quick response. It's it's pretty nice to see. Yeah, and big shout out to uh, Chris Howland who who started that group. All right, uh, what expendables do you like to use? I'm using the uh, Bubble Bee fur a lot. I bought one of the what they call a piece of fur, and I was for the longest time I was doing a thing where I had pre-cut circles of it, and I would use those over DPA concealers, and you'd get quite a bit of mileage out of it. Like it was an expendable, but I get away with using it like ten to twenty times before I found it. The fur was all matted and I needed needed to change it, you know what I mean? I, I still do that. I just use thinner strips of it because I'm using those Ursa concealers they have for DPAs now, which are great. I use uh, Ursa soft strips. I find those are, are pretty good. Oh, the, the piece of fur is, by the way, I have large sort of rectangles and squares of that cut out, which I use for helping with clothing noise. So putting those sort of around the area where the mic is, I find to be very, very helpful, um, especially if it, if someone, let's say, an actor, male actor with a very sort of, you know, like hairy chest or something, and they're wearing a, a dress shirt, that creates tons of noise, like the, the shirt interacting with all the chest hair. So putting fur on the inside of the shirt facing back towards the hair on both sides of the lav mic, I find is really helpful. It just sort of makes a barrier uh, to stop the, the shirt rubbing against the hair. So that's a great expendable, I find. Um, and there's other companies that offer, which I use as well. I use Ryko Overcovers, which are the same thing. They're just sort of pre-made for you. I use a lot of top stick, as you can imagine, as most of us, most of us do. Super stick it dots uh, are pretty handy. Just all the usual types of tape. There's Transpore. Durapore, all the all the various medical types that uh, that we find are pretty handy for se- for securing wires and things like the skin. All the tapes we use pretty much are they're all hypoallergenic, um, but it is worth mentioning that that doesn't mean it's going to be okay with skin. It depends on the person you're dealing with. Uh, you know, hypo means less. Hypoallergenic means less. Aller- it doesn't mean non-allergenic, right? So always something to bear in mind uh, when you're when you're using tape and skin. Yeah, I had a. We were working with an actress recently, and whatever dress she had, I tried every possible option, but the dress was making so much noise. And I, you know, and I always ask, you know, are you allergic to any kind of medical tape? And she said no. So I ended up, you know, using a little setup and then just just taped it right to her chest, inside her, you know, inside the dress area, and that that helped a lot. But yeah, I, I try not to do that and then also too always try to keep some little alcohol pads because you know you get a little sticky residue left when they take that off right right i do have those yeah yeah i've got a yeah i can see them right now in my, in my gear i've got little just sort of pouches of alcohol wipes for, for things like that and for cleaning other pieces of gear as well i had the same experience as you up until i we weren't allowed to attach the mic to our actress's skin there was a problem with uh tan that this like fake tan that she had to use and um, where it wasn't differing with that we had to go to these really noisy dresses uh, that she was wearing and sometimes we just couldn't make it work you know sometimes the dress would just be too much um i don't necessarily i don't blame the wardrobe department they're really helpful it's just that's those are the dresses they got chosen you know what i mean so it would, it would always just come down to if it was a two shot or something uh, my boom up Marlon Clark, I would just, I would just say, here, look, Marlon, like you, you have to favor her with the boom. You know, we tried everything with the lav; it's not the best. You know, the other, the other person's lav is good. If you can get both of them, great. But by all means, favor her. Make sure we have her good on the boom. 
Now, what was your favorite reality show that you've worked on so far? A lot of the time, I, I think on set, the crew makes the experience for you. You know, I did, I did a show on TLC called Rattled, which is about first time parents. And the, the parents we were filming lived on a boat, <laughs> on, a, on a marina down in, down in San Diego. And so that, the crew was just fantastic. Our, our field producer, she was incredible. Our DP was, was great fun. And the cast as well, the, the parents were, were great fun to work with. And it was just, it was an interesting scenario, you know, uh, jumping on and off of a boat as they prepare for the arrival of their baby. And, you know, they were trying to do things like um, safe proof the boat for, for the child. And they had to buy like specific things like the, the baby's bed had to be specifically knit with this, I guess, some sort of maritime cloth, which we, we went shopping with them to get that. But the crew was just fantastic. I think that's what makes the experience for a, for a lot of the work we do is uh, the people you're working with. If they're great to work with and fun and, and relaxed, you'll, you'll usually have a good time. Yeah, reality-wise, I think that was my favourite show I've worked on so far. I think First Time Flippers would be a close second because it's always kind of different with them. There's, a, there's like various episodes where we'll revisit the same people on the same house. But then there's always, you know, you'll, go, you'll move on to a new house, new couple, new problems. There's always something different. I think in terms of, if you were to ask me in general, what gigs I like doing the most, I like doing, I've been doing a lot of car commercials lately, which are really fun. I did one for, we say Hyundai in Europe, you say Hyundai in the, in the US, right? Yeah, I did, so I did one for, for Hyundai, we could say, Um and it was at this test track that they have uh, in the Mojave Desert. And so not only was I recording our host, comparing these different types of cars, I was, I was given a list for, for a post of sound effects they needed. And so I had knowledge of recording vehicles, you know, as I mentioned, you know, like the British Army thing. I'd done a lot of vehicle recording stuff in the past. I was like, yeah, I can definitely take care of this for you. And uh, they sort of just said, here's a professional race driver, like, Tell them to do what you need. Just go nuts. Here's some bunch of cars. And so uh, that was really fun. It was kind of just mounting mics on a car and telling telling him what kind of manoeuvres I needed him to do in the car um, to knock out this list they'd given me. Um, so that was really fun. Did you get to ride along in any of those? On a few of them, yeah, because I had to get internal sounds um, of driving, which was great fun. It's kind of like being on a roller coaster. <laughs> didn't feel like work it really didn't feel like work it was great well uh, let's let's shift gears a little bit and talk about finances so one of our listeners uh his name is chris camacho wrote in mm -hmm. and he asked uh he just kind of wanted to know in general financial workflow like when you're you know keeping up with your expenses do you do your taxes yourself or do you have a cpa those kind of things i did my taxes myself until i moved to la then, then I now have a, a specialist do it uh, and actually haven't done mine yet for this year. I have a meeting next week to do them, which pro tip, don't, don't leave it this late to do taxes, by the way. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I have a specialist do taxes now. Previously, it was less complicated for me. Um, but when I, when I moved to LA, especially for that year in particular, I had done various jobs in various states and I didn't want to mess around with doing all of that myself through like TurboTax or something. I wanted to have someone who knew what they were doing, uh, have a look at it. I think there comes a point where if you're making enough, it's definitely worth going to a, a tax specialist. In terms of uh, managing your, your cash flow, what, what I do, and I'm sure there's, there's better ways of doing this, but, uh, but what I do is I just, I keep track of invoices just through Google and I, I have like a way of marking things paid and not paid. And then I always refer to the calendar to know like, oh, this job was over a month ago and they haven't paid me. I need better follow up on that. What, what happens like when you first connect with, with the job? Say, you know, a producer or a client contacts you for a project. How do you kind of go through the whole process of like, say, deal memos or quoting it out? Yeah, well, like the, the first thing is, this is my rate, right? You know what I mean? For uh, th this is what I want for labor, and this is what I want for just basic gear. 
pretty much you know everyone in the sound community knows like basic gear is like a you know recorder slash mixer boom two laughs right and then if you want anything else it's sort of like a la carte you just pay per item and here's a list of what I have and what I can get um, so yeah the first thing is just th- this is my rate you know that, that's that's the main struggle is just saying having them agree to your rate the things that go really well are sometimes when they just say yeah right that's fine and then you can just sort of mention well is there is there a deal memo uh, you need to send to me um, do you have a a, a COI a, a cert of insurance um, I see a lot of I see a lot of new sound mixers not getting COIs and I would highly recommend they always ask for that because I guarantee you the the person that owns the camera on the shoot you're on has a COI for that camera and you should definitely have one for your your gear. Well, for the listeners, kind of talk to us a little bit about the COI. So it's like a certificate of insurance. So it's just a, it's an agreement for the, the production is saying your, your gear is insured if something happens to it on set. You know, it'll it'll be covered, um, and it's something that the the production themselves or the producer for the shoot will they send it to you. You look over it, make sure it's good, and just sign it. But you know, certainly very very important because the alternative to that is an oral agreement or or a written agreement. Um, the last thing you want is something expensive breaking, and it's and it's you have to cover it. You know what I mean? Especially when the things we have are so expensive and some of them are just so delicate like a lav mic you know those those tend to break a lot or just you know like a wireless transmitter or something you know these are really pricey things and the last thing you want is for something to happen to them and and you end up being responsible also say you're on set you've already negotiated your your rate and then they want to add stuff like oh we need two more lav mics or oh uh, we need uh, five more Comtex. how do you handle that like it's on the fly things are happening quick people just want to add stuff so how do you keep track of that? Yeah, it's it's just a matter of, I guess, you know, diplomatically saying, you know, I can provide this. I have all of that here. Um, it's just going to cost extra. I'll either say, can I run this by the producers really quick? Or if, uh, you know, maybe one of the producers is working with you on set, you can just ask them really quick. Sometimes I've just had a director say, you know, don't worry about it. You'll, you'll get the extra rate for the gear, but it's gear I need right now. Can you Can you just make it happen? Uh, I have yet to run into an issue where I ended up having to provide extra gear and I didn't get paid for it. You know, the, the bigger issue is getting what you want up front, I, I think. Do you use any of the freelance job services? I do, yeah. I use Staff Me Up quite a bit. I use what's one called Production Beast, I think. Production Beast is actually how Vice News found me, strangely enough. And that's the only job I've gotten through them but they're like a permanent client, so it was definitely worth it. Yeah, Staff Me Up's probably the best one for me. There's also Production Hub works as well. Great thing about Staff Me Up, it's very easy to list credits on Staff Me Up to the point where I don't really send uh, resumes, CVs to people. I just sort of say, look at my Staff Me Up. Every possible credit I've ever had is on there. To list everything I'd have on one resume will be too big so usually you're just like you're listing select experience for them from the past couple of years and you've constantly got to update that i just i like the system staff me up have for listing credits in particular it's it's very easy now for some of our listeners out there that are looking to find their next freelance job do you have any tips you're going to network and i think networking is absolutely key if you're if you're going to make it as a as a freelancer in any industry you know, you want to be out there talking to people. Another thing I would say is, especially if you're in, if you're in a city or a town that's got a big film industry, just go out, meet people. When I moved to LA, where I said, if I'm invited to something, I'll go, r- regardless. Unless I'm working, I'll go. Uh, and I've pretty much held true to that since I moved to LA. And uh, it has always paid off. Like, I can't tell you the amount of times I've just gone to a party and met met a producer met a cinematographer given them my info and something comes of it you know what I mean I can't stress that enough just be out there in the world networking even if it isn't on set yeah I'm a member of Film Florida which is a non-profit organization that promotes you know film and television Mm -hmm. projects in Florida production 
So it's great. And, you know, there's opportunities to connect with people and be on different, you know, they have different councils and different things like that to be a part. And, but they're actively trying to grow production in Florida. And one of the other organizations, a sister organization, is Women in Film and Television. And you don't have to be a woman to be a part of it. Every year they have the, it's called the Jingle Mingle, and it's right around Christmas time. And it's a it's like the biggest networking event of the year. Mm-hmm. But I, I went this last year for the first time and I met I there were people there that I knew that I didn't realize were there. And then I met other people who later called me to be on their projects. So it really is a valuable tool to get out there and network. Yeah, abs- absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's definitely uh, more than more than worth your time to go to go to events like that and just meet new people. And the other crucial piece of advice I'd have is um, just be open to critique and be open to debate, right? Um, you know, don't don't try and shut down people who might just be giving you advice, things like that. It's very simplistic to say, oh, just be likable. But I will say it, you know, just, just be likable. I, I, I feel I've gotten called back a lot just because people liked working with me. You know, there's jobs I've done where I've gone home and I'm thinking to myself, oh, that, that didn't go well. You know, that was, that was weird. There was a lot of uh, things I couldn't control. I, I, did a, I did a really bad job mounting that lav mic and I was like, oh, I'm not, they're not calling me back. And sure enough, they'd, they'd call me back. One thing, and this is, <laughs> this is a sound mixer's absolute nightmare, uh, but it's relevant to this discussion. Once, I've been, I've been sound mixer since 2012, 2013. Once to me has it happened where my phone has gone off during something important, right? Once. And it was with a pretty high profile celebrity, I guess we were we were interviewing. And as soon as that happened, it's like, I'm never getting called back by these people. Because uh, <laughs> I was like, I'm I'm writing this this producer off, this director off, they're never gonna want to work with me again. I just blew this like long interview we were having, and I'm the sound guy and my phone went off. And just a couple of days later, they, they were hiring me on something else. Uh, and I was like, you, you do remember my phone went off during that one shot. And they were like, yeah, you're, but you're only human. And most importantly, we liked you. You know what I mean? Um, so that's key. If, if people like you, they'll, they'll hire you again. I'm not saying that's free reign to mess up. It certainly isn't. But uh, it's something to, something to bear in mind. Well, James, as we kind of start to wrap things up, uh, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? They can either email me. It's a jnolanaudio at gmail.com. It's J-N-O-L-A-N-A-U-D-I-O at gmail.com. Or you can check out my, my Instagram, which is Nolan Audio. It's 70% me doing production sound things and 30% me playing guitar every now and then. So most it's mostly production sound related. Well, James Nolan, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks so much, Michael. And a big thanks to all of our listeners out there. If you'd like us to discuss a particular topic, please send us an email at locationsoundpodcast at gmail.com. We would love for you to subscribe and leave us a comment. We're available on Apple Podcasts. And for Android users, check out Google Podcasts. Also, we're on Stitcher, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and on your favorite podcast app. Until next time, remember, sound is half the picture.